evolutionary art and visionary science are both investigations into the nature of reality. This is a quote by Leonard Schlein from his book, Art and Physics. There are some aspects of the natural world that are as beautiful, breathtaking, abstract as any work of art. And there are some works of art that seem to speak to us in instinctual ways that we cannot explain. So I'm here today as a scientific illustrator to share with you both my passion for art and science, two seemingly opposite subjects, one based in the world of mathematics, reality, structure, and the other in the world of beauty and imagination. Sometimes, however, these worlds collide, and both disciplines can serve us in similar ways. So from the dawn of time, humans have yearned to create, to put down the world as we see it. And perhaps we're looking here at one of the world's first scientific illustrations, an accurate teaching tool for young hunters. Or maybe it was a mystical homage to pay tribute to the animal spirit. But whatever it is, 32,000 years later, we can still appreciate its beauty and still learn from it. We can know the species and therefore what the environment these people lived in. So, from the beginning, art has been a tool. As time progressed, art remained a tool. In a mostly illiterate world, visual descriptions and not written ones were how people could learn. This is a page from the De Materia Medica, a kind of web MD of the Dark Ages. And here, accuracy became very important. It was a matter, in fact, between life and death, a poison plant and one that could save. And then to the golden age of art and science, the Renaissance, and the ultimate Renaissance man, Leonardo da Vinci, not just an artist, but a scientist as well. Without this ability of visual thinking and able to put things down on paper, would he be able to invent things before his time, like the helicopter? Who knows? Or without his in-depth study of the human body, going as far to dissect cadavers, would he have been able to paint such lifelike portrayals of the human form that have gone down in history like this? Some other artists that have crossed the line from art to science John Gould, Darwin's illustrator and ornithologist, actually made the identifications of his finches to all be different varieties of the same species, and therefore leading to a theory of evolution. Ernest Eichel, also a zoologist and an illustrator, sought to find the beauty in the things he studied, to illustrate the symmetry, colors, and these are sea creatures that he found. Even modern art, seemingly chaotic, abstract, meaningless, can teach us something, such as Jackson Pollock's number eight. But instead of dealing with the outer realities, works like this deal with the inner realities and become a map of consciousness and subconsciousness. Jackson Pollock once said, the modern artist is working and expressing an inner world. In other words, expressing the energy, the motion, and the other inner forces. And it might be coincidence, but the emergence of modern art into the abstract from the realistic came about the same time that a new leap in scientific thinking took place, going into the quantum and nuclear age where nothing is straightforward. So perhaps art like this is just a mirror in the leap in scientific thinking. So who is man the artist? He's the unspoiled core of every man. Before he's choked by schooling, training, and conditioning until the artist within shrivels up and is forgotten. This is a quote by Frederick Frank from his book, The Zen of Seeing. And that's where my story begins, as a child, wide-eyed, curious, um, loving nature, and how I managed to hold on to my artist within. Um, so as a kid, I wandered the woods alone with my dog. I sat silently observing. I just loved to explore and be outside. I'd dig up mud and make little sculptures of animals and dry them in the sun. Um, I just, I loved art and science both and never saw a disconnect between the two. And then in the sixth grade, I was nominated to a program that still exists today called the Girls in Science at the museum downtown here. And once a week, I got to go behind the scenes to the most magical and mysterious place on earth and learn lessons, look under the microscope. And it was here that I learned to quickly sketch the things I saw in the field or under the microscope. And they inspired not just my curiosity, but my creativity as well, and really showed me that art and science could be done together. It also taught me um, that drawing could be a meditation. As I began to draw more and more and really study things, a beautiful meditation takes place. Um, Walt Whitman once said, I believe a blade of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars. And it's true, even the tiniest and simplest things under acute observation can be found to have the most infinite complexity. 
And when the hand and the mind and the eye all get lost in that complexity, a beautiful meditation takes place as you completely lose yourself in your subject. Um, and you also can come to know with your mind's eye better than any other way to know it is to draw it. Um, after painting this little stick of lichen that I found in the woods years ago, I can still remember its landscape like it were some familiar place. I remember the colors I mixed to create the deep shadows, the subtle gradation from green to orange, and even the music I was listening to when I played it. So when you draw something, it really ingrains it perfectly in your mind. Different things, I remember seashells that I've drawn years ago and the subtle curves of every single one still. Um, so I'm going to talk now about a few projects that I've done as a scientific illustrator and what I've learned from them. So what do you see here? Anybody? I've got flower petals, tea. Fish scales. Fish scales. Um, it's actually a little tiny two centimeter big, two centimeter big crustacean called a sandhopper or sand flea. And um, I found it while running on the beach. I noticed a bright red speck, so I stopped to investigate it. And I carefully carried it home as I ran, trying not to crush it, because I'd never seen anything like this. Um, and I wanted to investigate it. So I put it into the microscope, and I decided to document my discovery through drawing it. So this was the beginning of a fascination of the tiny things of the world that normally would be crushed or ignored. But in it, I found such beauty, such shimmering iridescence, beautiful colors, such a mechanically and purposely structured little body. And it was the beginning of a love affair with the little tiny things. And for once in my life, insects were no longer something gross, but a marvel. <laughs> Under the microscope, they're perfectly engineered machines. And I never thought I would call a spider cute, but when I started looking at found a new love of little creatures. It's like I found a whole other universe that I never knew existed when I started looking into the microscope. And this is a western keeper wasp. Um, what do you see here? A lizard, I think. But what if I told you that this was smaller than my thumb? That's my thumbnail. So the whole thing is only about an inch long. And it was a new species, an undescribed species skink that I was asked to draw. So the documentation of every scale was very important, critical in its identification. The problem was with its tiny size looking under a microscope. Each scale was transparent, had a sheen, and there was an underlying color pattern that really disrupted the eye and was confusing. So needless to say, I spent hours and hours and hours staring under a microscope, looking at one scale at a time. And that little hand is about the size of a grain of sand. not a page out of the notebook. Each line and each letter and number is hand painted. And I carefully researched, reproduced notebooks, writings, mementos of a great hero of mine, Albert Einstein. So this is a traditional style of painting called a tantoi, which means fool the eye because it appears to be so real. And I knew I was succeeding when I'd try to pick up the pencil out of the painting or try to brush that tumbled piece of paper off. But my favorite part about this piece was not how it turned out, but the connection that I began to feel with Albert Einstein, carefully hand reproducing his notes. Studying somebody's writings and reading them is one thing, but to write out his equations and his handwriting and his thoughts in his own words, in his own handwriting, was a very, became a mystical experience for me and a way to be connected more than I ever thought I could to my hero. So it started out simply as an homage, trying to tell a story about him, but ultimately it was a great connection for me. Okay, can anybody guess what these notes are trying to say? <laughs> it looks like a made up science written in a foreign language, at least to me. So these are what somebody gave to me to make a piece of art out of. <laughs> the 
what a fair hacking pet. And the last project I'm going to talk about is my most challenging, but also my favorite. It's my favorite foremost because I got to live in Dinosaur National Monument for the summer, exploring, creating, alone in beautiful desert canyonland. And this is the famous quarry wall. I don't know if you're familiar with Dinosaur National Monument, but it's a whole cliff face enclosed in a building. It's full, chock full of dinosaur bones. And I actually got to climb up on it. It's green, thank you. Um, so this is the only thing here to suggest that a completely different world used to exist here. Um, an ancient river used to flood and push all the dead dinosaurs downstream into the sediment, creating just layers and layers of dinosaur bones that exist. So my task for the summer was to recreate this world that once existed in the Jurassic era in a mural. So out of all the images we have of dinosaurs out there, this is how it all begins. This is the only real thing that we can touch and see and create from basically look like rocks and bone. So, to begin, the paleontologist digs up the bones, identifies them, arranges them, assembles them. Then the paleo artist, like myself, comes in, and the imagination starts to come in, fleshing them out based on comparisons to modern animals. And then skin. And then the fun part, color and texture. And one of the most commonly asked questions that I get is, how do you know what color to make dinosaurs? And the answer is, I have no idea. I just make it up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do try to make educated guesses, like a predator or prey might want to be camouflaged, something like that. But if you think about the skeleton of a peacock or a giraffe, would it, there's no clue to suggest they're so colorful in pattern. So I do this. And all, I decide on final poses for all the dinosaurs for my final piece, both the skeleton, muscles, skin. Put it in a setting to get lighting and shading. And then the hardest part, coming up with the whole picture, the big idea. It's the most intimidating part about starting a big piece like this. How do you fit all these dinosaurs they want me to put in there? How do I make it exciting? How do I illustrate the landscape as well and give everything attention? So I start out with lots of sketches. It begins like this. I finally decided on this as a general idea. I wanted the action of the hunt. All the dinosaurs kind of aware of what's going on so they're not just static figures in the background. And then I refine this idea. And I refine it some more. And some more. And all the time, I'm still going out into the world, observing, looking at a pond, seeing how it reflects light, going into the woods, the little woods that were in the desert, and seeing how light played in jacket trees and how the shadows fell. And every evening, I'd go out with my camera, waiting for that perfect dinosaur sunset that I could use in my mural, because there's a lot of beautiful skies in the desert. And I knew I wanted to use a part of that. In my final piece, so here it is, the final mural. And my favorite part about this is how it will affect the views of kids everywhere and play in people's imaginations. Because I like to tell kids when I'm doing public demonstrations of my art that there were no cameras back then. Every picture you've ever seen of a dinosaur has been created by an artist like me. And we're so saturated with images of dinosaurs that we don't realize that artists have created every single image we've ever seen. So I'm very excited that my images now will get to play in the imaginations of so many people for so long. Um, another great thing about this is that I rediscovered my childhood love of dinosaurs. I remember as a little kid that we made my parents go out of the way on a cross-country trip, trip to stop a dinosaur national monument. So if somebody would have told me back then that not only do you get to contribute to them, but you get to do it by painting and creating, I never would have believed so the fact that I get to work with scientists, look under a microscope, but still use my imagination, get dirty, be creative, this has been a real dream come true. Um, so to wrap it up, as a scientific illustrator, I yearn to understand the world around me and share that with others through my work. Um, and often 